Tuesday students in the series of our GST lectures I will be taking two lectures the first one is communication and study skills and the second one will be word classes in English I am Adebola Adebileje I hope you will enjoy the lectures Good morning class. We want to look at the chapter titled Communication and Study Skills. Communication and Study Skills. Understanding the correct meaning of communication is essential to any serious study. Communication can be described as a two-way exercise that takes place between an active um, um, input of the sender and the receiver. In an academic setting, communication happens between the text and the student, and between the student and the lecturer. Communication is of various types. We have the downward communication and the upward communication. We also have the horizontal and crosswise communication. So also do we have the verbal slash nonverbal and written communication. What then do we mean by communication? Communication can be described or defined as the process of transferring signals or messages between a sender and a receiver through various methods. It could be written words, it could be nonverbal cues, it could also be spoken words. The communication process occurs as productive in which we have the sender speaking or writing and the receptive process in which we have the receiver either listening or reading. These are the two actions that happen when communication is taking place. There must be a sender, the sender is putting in the productive actions and there must be the receiver, the receiver puts on, puts in the um, receptive actions which involve listening and reading. So by extension we could say that the sender of the information is the lecturer or the text while the receiver of the information will be the student listening or reading the information. Therefore, a good communication process should contain seven elements. Number one, the thought or idea. In other words, before communication takes place, there must be something, an information that is being passed to the receiver. Number two, there must be the process of encoding the thought or the idea. In other words, if for instance you are hungry, that thought of hunger needs to be encoded in words, oral or written before it can be passed to whoever will receive it. The thought process involves the transmission of that message or the channel through which the transmission takes place. Then, naturally, the next process would be the reception of the message. In other words, there must be somebody the information is uh, uh, um, needed 
the information is meant for. So that person will be the one to receive that message, that thought, or that idea. The fifth process involves the decoding of the message by the receiver. The receiver needs to understand the idea that has been sent out. Understanding the decoded idea or thought will be the next process. And then there must be a feedback of the receiver to the sender as a sign of confirmation of the communication that has taken place. Therefore, this means that if any information is sent out, there must be a confirmation that the sender has received that message correctly. Therefore, when a lecturer is teaching, students are expected to receive the information correctly so that when they are now re responding, when they are expected to recall what they have been taught, they would bring out the correct information received. That is why we are particular about communication, so that students receive the correct information sent out by the lecturer or by the text being read. There are some important points to note, however. You must understand that communication gap occurs when there is noise between the sender and receiver or vice versa. In other words, when there is noise in the environment, the receiver may not receive the correct information and the sender may not receive the correct response from the receiver if there is noise. Therefore, noise must be eliminated. It is not only noise we should eliminate when communication is taking place. Students must ensure that their attention is 100% is paid to the information being sent out by the lecturer so that the correct information is received. Another important point to note here is that communication also involves three components. We have the verbal message, we have the paraverbal message, and we have the nonverbal message. Therefore, a student should not pay attention only to the words that come out of the um, mouth of the lecturer alone, but also there are some gestures that must be uh, um, understood by students when a lecturer is talking because such paraverbal messages help to understand what the information the lecturer is sending out actually means. Then we must also pay attention to non-verbal messages. You must take note of what annoys the lecturer in class. You must also take note of some other gestures that the lecturer may be projecting in order for you to understand um, some other aspects of the lecturer that may help you to understand the whole concept of the lecture being presented. These three components are used to send clear, concise messages and to receive correctly understood messages. It is important that we choose words that will make a message as clear as possible, avoiding jargons. This tells us that there are characteristics of an effective communicator. Somebody sending out messages must be aware that he must be very clear 
of the thought or idea he or she is sending out. If you are not so sure of the idea or thought you are sending out, there is no how the receiver would understand what you are trying to say. An effective communicator should also demonstrate confidence by way of body language and must radiate energy or enthusiasm as so as to create positive impact in the minds of receivers. Actually, this aspect affects the sender of any information more than the receiver. He or she must assess the maturity level of the audience and must communicate accordingly. For instance, a lecturer is expected to come down to the level of the students he, he is teaching so that when you are explaining a particular topic to them you don't have to choose words that would lead students to read using their dictionary before they understand use and choose simple words that will aid easy understanding a good communicator must not use loaded language be explicit simple use of words a good communicator must also prevent any form of barriers in communication in other words the idea of sending out any information is for the receiver to understand such information so there is no sense in making it more difficult for the receiver to understand such message sent the communicator must maintain consistent verbal and body language in other words he or she must be temporal in his emotion it will discourage students when you talk to them in anger when you express your emotion negatively to them they will i mean the, the attention will be placed on your emotion rather than on the information you are passing on to them so it is advisable that a good communicator maintains consistency in both verbal and body language there must be eye contact with the receiver you you hold the attention of your audience by maintaining consistent eye contact with them it must be sustained now in order for us to have effective communication we need to look into some communicate communication skills communication skills consist of the four basic skills of listening speaking reading and writing these are also the basic skills of any language what do we mean by listening skill listening is the ability to understand both the information being sent and how the speaker feels about what is being communicated listening involves the following processes the reception stage that is the stage where the information is received the concentration stage that is the stage where you want to process what you have received where you have you have to establish that information in order for you to be able to decode and then accept the information and the last stage is the storing stage you want to store that information into your memory in other words if there must be an effective listening process all the five stages mentioned here must have been activated one important way of showing effective listening is the ability to take good notes a student that is very serious would learn how to take notes note taking refers to notes taken from listening to a lecture which may be live or recorded note taking is essential for the following reasons 
Number one, it gets main points made by the lecturer recorded for future references. When you go to class, listening alone without taking notes may not be as effective as you think because by the time you take another lecture, you may have forgotten some important points from the first one you listened to. Therefore, as you listen to lectures, it is advisable that you also take notes of important points for future references. It also makes vital information handy during revision. You will agree with me that you listen to lectures in order for you to be able to understand what is being taught and when the time comes to be tested. So when you take notes, you will have something to fall back on and revise. It gives a true picture of how much a student got during a lecture. In other words, when you take notes, it will show that you actually were attentive when the lecture was being delivered. It also guides students into individual research. How do we keep notes? In other words, what do you need for you to take effective notes during lectures as you listen to such lectures? You may get a loose leaf folder rather than a bound book. That is, you get a file where you put loose leaves of, um, of paper, of, 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 um, of any writing material, because this will allow you to reorder, to re, re, re rewrite, or to remove or add more pages to a particular topic. It is flexible because it's not taking you may want to rearrange, you may want to do so many things to a loose leaf file rather than a bound book. How do we now write notes, such notes that we take during lectures? Number one, you must note that you will have to take only the main points from what is being said by the lecturer. You may want to disregard irrelevant illustrations at this point. You will need to summarize main points. As the lecturer talks, you listen attentively and you bring out what you feel is germane to the topic being discussed. And that is what you jot in your notepad. Then, to make it faster for you, you, you make use of abbreviations. Instead of writing out a whole sentence, you can just write the short forms to um, um, have more time to write as many more points as possible. After taking notes, it is advisable that you compare notes with others in the class. And then you need to do a layout of your notes with the following points in mind. Number one, it is good for you to write the course title, you write the lecturer's name, and the date of that lecture on top of the paper, on top of the page you are writing your notes on. You leave some space between different items. So what we are saying here is that at the beginning of each lecture, write the title, write the course title, write the lecturer's name and the date on top of the page. They will help you to identify who taught it, when it was taught, and then it may even add some more information to understanding what you jotted. Then you leave wide margins for later comments and related references. This will allow for more um, writing of information when you begin to read your notes. You can use colored pens to underline keywords and circle important words and phrases. When you do this with different colors, 
it, 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 it helps your memory. It makes you remember what you were taught, what the lecturer was saying, why he said it, and then you understand much better than when you just read through the notes. You could also use diagrams, pictures, charts, and graphs when you are putting down your notes because this would also help you to understand what you are reading. Now, what, there are some things we need to consider if we actually want to listen very well. Learning to listen better involves the following. When the lecturer is delivering his lectures, try to listen for topics and themes. Many students don't even pay attention, they don't come early enough to class to listen to what topic the lecturer is discussing. So for you to understand the entire lecture, pay attention to the topic and then the theme, that is the reason for that lecture. It will help and aid your understanding. Listen for main ideas. Differentiate between facts and opinion. In the course of delivering a lecture, the lecturer might have given you the main fact, after which he could now begin to express his own opinion. Don't forget that the fact he had delivered is different from his own personal opinion. But you are concerned with facts. So you need to differentiate between facts and opinion. Listen for relevant points. Don't get carried away. Pay attention to what is said. That is how you can identify relevance from irrelevant points. Listen for other specific purposes and wait and watch for non-verbal communication. You can understand the likes and dislikes of any lecturer by paying attention to non-verbal and paraverbal gestures of any lecturer. That means that a student must pay 100% attention to what the lecturer says. Having said that, on listening skill, we will go on to the next skill, which is the reading skill. The reading skill needs to be improved by any serious student. And reading skills that we are talking about here include the major, it involves the major part of any student's study time. Success at university is directly related to reading ability. Many students also have not had any instruction in reading since primary school. Therefore, the reading skill of any student must be improved. Reading is also a developmental and continuous process which needs to be continuously improved upon. What then is reading? Reading is a process. Developing one's reading speed alone does not necessarily result in efficiency. One must develop one's comprehension as well. What we mean here is that the reading process actually does not involve you putting your eyes on written text and then reading through alone. Effective reading involves comprehension. If you tell me you have read through a text, that means you are telling me you have understood the content of such a text. So reading involves comprehension. There are three, um, there are four stages for study reading. 
which is termed SQ3R. SQ3R. What do we mean by this um, terminology? S is for survey. That is, reading involves um, looking through the whole of the material before reading. You need to scan through a particular material to be read first before you sit down to do the actual reading itself. The Q in this terminology is for questions. Formulating questions means looking through, scanning through the whole material and then asking yourself some questions. Why has the author written this? What does the author want from me? What do I need to, what do I have to benefit from this text? Such questions will help you to understand the content of that um, material. The three R means read, recall, and review. After scanning through the material and then asking your questions, general questions about that material, then you read carefully, actively, and critically. Then the next stage involves recall. You recall, you try to recite from memory, mentally or orally, to yourself, to a friend, the information or main points you have gathered from your reading. Many students don't go through this process we are talking about. And when they tell you that they have read, ask them questions they will not be able to answer correctly. That shows that reading, effective reading has not taken place. Effective reading must go through this um, process we have itemized, SQ3R. After the process of recalling, the next one involves reviewing. Reviewing includes surveying the whole text again and re-identifying the major ideas and important details. Rereading sections that have been noted or underlined, recalling material in sequence, and then reviewing notes. This is where the essence of reading actually lies. When you are studying, you will read and then subject yourself to a kind of examination to a kind of test ask yourself what have i gained from this reading i have i have been involved in close your text and then ask yourself questions and then try and answer such questions often without referring to the text the more you are able to answer such questions correctly that shows the more you, you understand that you have actually gone through effective reading. Then we move on to the third skill, which is the writing skill. The writing skill is an important part of communication also. Writing communication is usually more formal in style than spoken communication because the message must be expressed in words. When we talk about written communication, we are only limited to writing. I will write to you and you respond to me by writing back. But oral communication or spoken communication involves me talking to you and then you respond to me by talking also. However, a written message cannot make use of any of the non-verbal aspects of communication that are naturally used when speaking. Writing has three stages or processes. We have the pre-writing stage, followed by the actual writing stage, and then post-writing stage. 
those are the three stages involved when we are talking about writing. The pre-writing stage involves choosing an appropriate topic, you know, there is no how you can say you want to write without having a topic you want to write on. So the first thing you need to do is to pick a suitable topic known to you and then after picking that topic you go on to the writing stage. The writing stage is the stage where logical arrangements of information are arranged purposefully to show how they relate to one another. To have a good um, writing, it is advisable that an outline should be drawn to achieve this. What do we mean by outline? Outlines are formal detailed statement of the content and structure of a piece of writing and they are good for note takings and summarizing. There are types of outlines which include systems of notation illustrated as 